Uh, so, uh, you guys know from command, my name is Nick Miser. I'm currently at Texas A&M University, which is in College Station, uh, a couple hours east of Austin, and, or a couple hours north of Houston, depending on how you look at it. And I'm getting my PhD in anthropology. I'm in my fourth year of coursework, which is my last year of coursework. Uh, I've been doing some preliminary fieldwork. Actually, I met um, Richard doing fieldwork at GaryCon. Um, who is the gentleman in the blue, sh or I guess it's black. Looks good. <laughs> I know from experience that it's black, but it's... Uh, I met him doing field work at Gary Con, which is, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, it's a really cool little gaming convention up in Lake Geneva. And, uh, but I'll uh, hopefully start full-time field work in the spring. I'm, actually, I will find out about my funding in the next month or so. And then write my dissertation, hopefully be uh, out of here in a couple of years. Um, so my field, my research, uh, like I said in the, the thing, um, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I uh, focus on, why well, I, I guess the easiest way to talk about it is the way that I got into studying D&D, &D, to give you some background. Um, I was a history major when I first got into college and then just found that the things that I was interested in kept driving me towards more cultural type topics. And so I ended up um, switching to anthropology. And we kind of had a growing anthropology program at that point and some new people coming in. Um, most notably, uh, 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 Kevin Piddle uh, was uh, uh, my, a professor of mine that was really, really influential in kind of getting me uh, spun up on mythology, anthropology of mythology, religion, folklore. Um, so I started getting increasingly interested in, in folklore and mythology in particular and um, got to my senior year where I had to figure out what I was going to write a senior thesis on and I, it just kind of clicked with me at that point uh, one day just sitting there that, uh, that the relationship between myth and ritual that people were talking about in a lot of the stuff that I was reading was very similar to the relationship between uh, play and narrative, or like the gameplay aspects of D&D &D and the, the storytelling aspects of D&D. &D. And so that kind of got me started uh, thinking about how to think about D&D &D and role-playing games as folklore. And I had gamed a little bit growing up on and off, like a few short stints of maybe three or four sessions of uh, one of the Star Wars games, I don't even remember which one, a really off the I have no idea. The first thing I ever played was called Shatter Zone, and you can find it online. It's like uh, Richard's nodding his head. I'm surprised that anyone has heard of it. I don't. Uh, I've never heard anyone talk about it outside of me playing it when I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about the mechanics or anything. But so Shatter Zone, Star Wars. I think that was it. I played probably a total of six sessions, uh, but I was always interested. I was doing computer gaming and such, and I was interested in D and D. Until that senior year when I started, uh, decided that I, I wanted to study it, kind of gave me an excuse to, to get into playing again. So I've been playing full time since then, which was 2008, not, no, 2006. So uh, about six years now. And I mostly DM. Um, I guess the, the first question that I had was about what specifically my research is, so I can. Uh, explain that a little bit. Um, what I'm looking at basically is I'd want to lay out uh, and do a very his a kind of a historically informed study looking at uh, from the origins of the game, just 74 as, as, a, as a date of publication, up until now. So about, we've had about 40 years and just trying to trace the different ways that uh, as a culture gamers have thought about the relationship between play and narrative and kind of the, the best way, uh, the, the different ways that people have argued are the best way for storytelling to emerge out of gameplay or how they, whether or not they even care about storytelling in their play. Uh, so kind of tracing trajectories of that over time and how kind of how those ideas have, have evolved and changed and especially with the old school renaissance, uh, how we've had this, you know, uh, revival but also we're kind of reinventing in certain ways how we think about um, narratives. Uh, so looking at that 
and is, was one component. The second component would be uh, looking at how we construct shared understandings of the imagined spaces in the game. So the idea that none of us, especially if you're just doing tabletop as opposed to LARPing or anything that has a more visual component to it, that we can't, none of us can see the, the place that we're imagining our characters to be, but we all have to negotiate uh, an understanding that's the same enough that we can act, that we can interact with that world together. And so looking at that process of negotiation and uh, that ties into a lot of other things that anthropologists have uh, been talking about over the past 20 years or so about uh, how humans in general understand space and place and uh, changes in that in recent years. So the, the relationship between narrative and play, the connection between space and place, or the, 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 spa the imagined spaces, and then the, uh, the last thing would be looking at how both of those things and how they've changed over time interacts with someone's own personal life history in gaming. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of different stories of how people get into gaming, and then maybe they, uh, a lot of times you'll see if, if someone's older, uh, you know, 30s, 40s, whatever, and not like a, a kid in their initial exposure to it, then they've often had like a hiatus for 10, 15 years where they didn't play at all. And then they've, I, I've talked to a lot of people who, you know, come back to it after 15 years. So, but I mean, that's only one, that's only one life arc that people have of interacting with it. But the idea of that we have people now who've been doing this for 40 or 50 years and how that changes the way that they interact with the imagined spaces and uh, how they view story. Uh, so that's kind of a general sketch of, of what I want to do. Um, any any questions of, of that, at this point? I mean, I can ramble on forever, but... <laughs> um, so I was wondering what kind of theories you're using specifically, like any names of, like, are there any specific theorists that you really latched onto for this project, or... Are you just going yeah. all over in myth and ritual? Well, and it, uh, kind of oddly enough, the stuff that I end up drawing on most, or that I have been up until this point, aren't people who really just focused on on the interpreting mythology or, or folklore, or maybe folklore, but definitely not mythology or ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, been, been more about um, social interaction. People just focus on interaction in general. So Irving Goffman. Um, with his concept of frame analysis and thinking about the ways that um, I, I'm assuming that uh, I know Judith is, is in an anthropology program right now, so I'm assuming she knows uh, Irving Goffman, but for other people, I'll um, give a short summary. So Irving Goffman has this, this cool way of trying to understand how humans structure our, their experience of reality, and he thinks about it in terms of frames, which is basically he comes up with a way for it to analyze that if I tell you that my cousin's best friend told him a story, and in that story um, there was a guy named Mike, and Mike's history teacher uh, was explaining to him in class one day that ha that Shakespeare wrote a play where Hamlet said the play's the thing and wherein where I'll catch the conscience of the king. Um, and... Irving Goffman wants to be able to understand all of those different levels of reality that I'm talking about, from where Hamlet is, uh, where Hamlet, the the world in which Hamlet is a real person, uh, which is wrapped in the pl uh, the play, which is wrapped in this uh, fictional story, where a high school teacher is t teaching kids about this, which is wrapped in a narrative that um, that was told to various people, and kind of these he calls them laminations uh, on on reality. So the way that we understand all of the the passing between that, and that's been really central to the to um, to D and D from the beginning, or I mean the study of D and D from the beginning. The first book, the the first big book that was written on D and D was called um, Shared Fantasy by Gary Allen Fine, and he kind of started using Goffman right off the bat. So that's kind of foundational, I think, to to understanding. We have the in-game reality that we inhabit as characters. We have the kind of game frame that we inhabit as players, where the rules uh, are structuring our understanding of reality, and then we have the social reality outside of that, where we're just interacting as people 
and friends and playing any other kind of other roles that we that we have in our uh, more mundane lives. That's probably the most central theorist. The other people I look at are uh, Gregory Bateson. Um, uh, who else have I been? I've been really interested in phenomenology lately, actually. Um, kind of just kind of in line with Goffman, of just paying really careful attention to the experiences that we have while gaming. So trying to think really carefully about our experience of time when we play, for example, where when you're in combat, the relationship between time, in-game time and out-of-game time is different than when you're in exploration, uh, which is different from when you're in kind of overland exploration. So I've actually just, like looked at in in sessions thinking about their relationship and how it feels different as you've got fluctuating relationships between the two time streams. Awesome. Have you uh, looked at uh, Robert Alter's uh, Imagine Cities? Because it sounds like some that might tie into your work. I mean, it's a book where he looks at other authors like Flaubert, um, Kafka, Dickens, a couple other people, and uh, looks at how the way cities were imagined and, you know, from the development into the more modern era has changed our perception of cities. That seems, yeah, I haven't, I, I just wrote it down though because it does seem really fitting and, um, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of it is the, there's a talk that I gave uh, at a couple different conferences specifically looking at uh, the, the issue of mapping as a way of understanding the game world and I really like, I really love the idea that the map that we make when we're as players exists both in our reality and it's a representation of the actual map that the character's making. Um, so that's what the talk is about, but in the end of the talk I, I show side by side a street map of Chicago, Illinois and a section of Greyhawk Dungeon. Uh, and I think there's a lot of um, similarities between especially like real modernistic cities that are built on grids and the the way that we think about space in D&D &D too. So I think there's a, a, a play back and forth. So I wrote that down. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. And then you were talking about the ritualistic aspect, and so I was wondering if you've uh, by chance looked at uh, the Joseph Campbell Masks of God series. Yeah. Especially uh, volume four. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I've, I'm familiar. I don't know if I've read vo that specific volume, but in general, um, yeah. I mean, you know, the one of the things to know about anthropologists is that uh, we, I'll say we, and take ownership of it. We like, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we like to poke holes in things and show why things are bad ideas. And, <laughs> And I actually, I personally don't like doing that. I, I, I'm teaching a folklore class right now, and that I, in the textbook, I feel like they spend 80% of the time pointing out problems with people's ideas, and 20% of the time actually think, saying, like, oh, this person still has a lot of good things to say. Uh, and so I'm trying to reverse that w when I'm teaching it. But Joseph Campbell is one of those people that uh, a lot of contemporary anthropologists kind of love to hate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest, I, I really like Joseph Campbell, and I, I like Jungian approaches in general. Um, but I think that the, the problem people tend to have is that, the, just in general, Campbell wants to explain a lot of things. Uh, and I think that as long as you can acknowledge that the more things you want to explain, the less, the less comprehensively you're going to explain them, then if you acknowledge that fact, I think that um, that Joseph Campbell's approach becomes another tool in the box of like trying to understand things. So you can kind of have really particularistic studies, which is what people want to do, of focusing on uh, very context-oriented things where I'm not going to compare this myth to anything else. I just want to understand it as it exists in this specific culture at this specific time and this specific performance. Um, I think that you can have that and Joseph Campbell's approach of, well, let's also try and think of it in the context of everything else. I have a question. Can you hear me? Because I added a microphone. Okay. Um, how does 
Victor Turner's ritual and liminality figure in mesh with the phenomenology and the framing? Um, well, first I'll say that I was realizing the other day that I have, although I... I, well, I, I, don't, I haven't read nearly as much Victor Turner as I feel like I have. <laughs> uh, and just in general, as have we all. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for those not familiar, Victor Turner is an anthropologist who's um, often lumped together with Clifford Geertz, who's another person that I've read more of, but I, I more think in terms of them than I actually... I think that I, I kind of see everything through their perspective a lot of times. So it's hard <laughs> Uh, to to cut out and really think about to externalize it, but uh, really is looking at symbolic approaches um, uh, and the way that symbolism is a system that helps us understand the whole culture. But uh, with the liminality thing, I think with okay, so liminality or Victor Turner and phenomenology, I think that there is a lot of connection points between the two. Um, whenever you're looking at those rituals that he looks at where people, the rites of initiation, um, it all becomes very like tactile and thinking about the ways that people are experiencing things. I think he's probably a little bit more intellectual in a weird, I mean, phenomenologists are like crazy intellectuals. They sound like crazy people whenever they talk, but, uh, and they have all kinds of crazy terms that they use. But they're they're a very like embodied. They they try and think about things in very embodied terms. So they they don't care about when they're trying to explain the phenomena of sight. They don't care about um, like biological explanations of how the of how the, the the signals go to my brain or whatever. They just want to know what does it feel like to see things. And Turner's kind of like that sometimes, but he's also because he's interested in making a whole system. I think that he's. A little more abstract. Uh, I don't know if abstract is the right word. So I think there's a lot of connection points, but that they they're also very different in what they want to do. I think. Oh, thank you. Anything? Any other? Um, can I ask a question, uh, another question, or else I'm going to just talk about random things for until I run out of time. <laughs> you can just talk. Uh, all right. Um, let's, um, one thing, I guess one thing I want to, I, I can say is that um, I think it'd be good for, for, for people that aren't in anthropology to know where the study of pop culture, like I'm doing fits in anthropology. And so if you guys don't know much about anthropology, you probably know that it it's focus, it tends to be focused on like faraway tribes and exotic cultures and things like that. At least historically that's what it was. And in the past probably fifty years, anthropology really had this big crisis where they they really realized that when all you do is focus on other people or people that are really, really different from you, then you you they, they, you exoticize those people and you can't really engage with them um, in the in a as as fellow human beings in a certain way because all that you're interested in is them being really exotic. And so there's been a lot of critique in anthropology about like um, realizing how much in when we exoticize or other these these peoples, these other people that we're participating in things that, that ultimately don't help them. So there's and it's kind of tied up with postmodernity and all these criticisms that they've had. Um, but one of the things that it's opened up since then is that people realize that all these things that we've been doing could be used to to study ourselves or, or also. And so more kind of uh, things closer to home from the perspective of a Westerner, at least, um, can be studied with anthropology as well. And and part of that is because a lot of those anthropologists that were studying other people, they understood that there's a really great quotation, I don't remember who said it, but they said that the purpose of anthropology is to take something that's um, that seems exotic 
and make it seem, uh, or take something that's strange and make it seem normal in order that you can take the things that you think are normal and realize how strange they are. Uh, so they, they knew that even when we were studying all these other people that were so that were so weird, what we were really doing was just studying ourselves and kind of using them in a weird way to, to think about ourselves. And so people weren't super comfortable with that when you're, if, uh, if you're just using these other people uh, as a tool to understand yourself and that's all you're doing, that obviously is, seems kind of problematic. So, but that's where it opens up for people like me to be able to just study uh, American kids, or not even kids, I probably, most of the people I work with are older than me. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, not the target demographic of what you'd think of as anthropology, and it's but it's, it's growing and opening up that that's accepted to do, uh, although it's still, um, with D&D &D specifically, it's hard because there's I, I uh, had a funding application that I sent out earlier this year for uh, to get money to be able to go to fly around and hang out in people's gaming groups and record them and do interviews and such. And one, one the the feedback that I got back, and I actually have to write a response to this feedback in the next week or so here, so it's at the front of my mind. Uh, all of it was based on the assumption that I was studying video games. Uh, so there's still just not a lot of familiarity, obviously, with specifically with, with tabletop gaming. And what happened, I think, in academia in general is that when D&D first came out, no one really paid much attention. And then you had the... Well, Gary Fine got in there really early, actually. I think his book came out in 81. Um, so I think he's to be commended for that. And the, the way that he handles it is so good that I think his, his book holds up, you know, 40 years later... Uh, it's not like you read it and think, oh, he did, he just didn't get D and D. I, when I read it, at least, I feel like he got what was going on. So you have Gary Fine, and he kind of sticks out. But then you have a couple other people that touch on D and D because there's the Satanism scare, and mostly, to their credit, a lot of academics would step in and go to bat for for role playing games and and kind of discredit the the connection that people wanted to make with this purported Satanism that was going on. So they, they kind of did that, and then it died on, they, they did their job, and people mostly backed off of us, uh, us being D&D, &D, or being in general, I guess. Uh, and then no one really thought about, in academic circles, I don't, it doesn't seem like anyone thought about gaming for a little while. And then you have, like, WoW and all these... Uh, uh, mostly the online gaming take off, and then suddenly that's really sexy to study. And so everyone's writing stuff about EverQuest and World of Warcraft and Second Life, and those are great, those are great books, and there's a, I mean, a lot of good work that's being done in it. But uh, especially in like game studies, where, which is a, a developing discipline that's awesome, uh, they just focus on video games, and it's like there's this big gap where a lot of people are studying video games without fully having thought about the things that produced them. Because uh, every video game that's out there, uh, you'd be really hard-pressed to find a video game that's, that, that does not owe most of its underlying structure to Dungeons & Dragons. Um, and I know Richard uh, and I have talked about even how the very uh, metaphors by which we think about the Internet um, are structured uh, arguably and historically by D&D. Um, so it kind of drops off the radar, and, and they, they, but at the same time, video game studies people tend to be really supportive of it, uh, of studying D&D, &D, and they're like, oh, yeah, I've always thought that we should do that. So it's growing, and we've had a lot of books come out in the past three or four years on, that are academic about D&D, &D, so people aren't familiar with them, and I'm going to miss some of them. And if any of them that I miss are hearing this, then they'll think I was trying to short them, but I'm not. Um, Sarah Bowman has a book called The Functions of Role-Playing Games, a book called, by Michael Tresca called The Evolution of Role-Playing Games. I'm looking at some of them over here. There was a great edited volume a little while ago called Gaming as Culture. I was just talking to Richard at the beginning of the class. The most comprehensive history of D&D, &D, at least in the early, like things leading up to D&D &D and the immediate fallout from its release, just came out a few months ago, and if you're if you've been on online and in gaming circles at all, you've, you've 
you're probably familiar with it, but it's called Playing at the World, and it's 700 pages, and I get to read it as part of my schoolwork, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, John is kind of blowing my mind with the amount of research he's done for that book, and it's it's forcing me to go back and change some of the ways that I've thought about um, about the development and just really expanding my thoughts about it. Actually, I have an article that's going to come out in a few years in the Journal of Popular Culture, but the history of D&D, but I now have to go Yay. back and completely revise sections of because of, of John's book, um, which is great. Uh, but the, mostly it's things where I'd be like, and not much is known about this, this, what happened between these two points. And then John like has, you know, 200 pages on it. So, uh, just going in those two. So that's um, a, a very brief state of the study of D and D right now. I feel like it's when I first started studying D and D in two thousand six, I felt like no one else is doing this. This is awesome. Like I'm going to be the only guy studying D and D. Um, and I think probably most people think that when they start studying something, because you. <laughs> Um, but I was probably less wrong thinking that in 2006 than I would be if I thought that now, because I, there's just more and more people um, getting in on it, and a lot of good, a lot of good discussion happening. So that's my state of the studies. So um, when you talk about game studies, is that sort of a subdiscipline under media studies, or would it be under just culture, pop culture stuff? Where does that fit in with I'm academia? I'm active with game studies guy uh, folks at, at the Popular Culture Association, American Culture Association meetings. Uh -huh. So uh, it's kind of, at least when they show up there, they're operating under popular studies, <laughs> which okay. uh, be, and let me put it, I'll put in a minor plug. If anyone, if you guys ever find out that there's a popular culture association meeting in your town, even if you're not an academic, if you're someone who likes to think about, like, your fandom, then you should go, because there's, you could sit in a room and listen to people talk about Joss Whedon and uh, <laughs> you know, pick your, your thing that you're a fan of, and you can listen to smart people talk about it for an entire weekend. So, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone's coming to Eastern Washington to talk about that. <laughs> They have regional associations. Um, there's a big, the PCA is really well organized, I think. I don't know where they're, I'm sure they have a northwest region. I don't know where they actually are, though. Probably Seattle. <laughs> but I think that and some of them operate under media studies, communication. Some of them have their own departments, too. Hmm. Um, like I know San Diego, uh, I'm not really familiar with. Well, that's a lot like folklore is. You you get anthropologists and, and literature people and communications people and everything else. Yeah, well, and, and with D and D too, the the people that I mentioned, Sarah Bowman is, I think she's in like an English program. Like pretty much every one of those books that I mentioned, the person was from a different discipline. So, um, which I guess leads the the question of what anthropology brings to the table that other disciplines don't bring, which is, um, I think, a strong emphasis on, on, on field work. Uh, Gary Fine did field work for his first thing. He was a very, like, kind of, or he is, he's still uh, doing work, not in D&D, but very, he's a sociologist, but he feels a lot like an anthropologist when the way he goes at things as far as method, methodology. But so, um, uh, particular, so field work. But one of the things I think the anthropology can bring to the table that hasn't been done really intensely is, for example, if you read a book about someone studying D&D, &D, uh, you don't often find real in-depth analysis of, like, a line-by-line -line transcript, for example. And that's something that in linguistic anthropology especially they've really focused on. And the exception to that is um, the, some of the most detailed uh, book stuff that's in book length is a book called um, the 
creation of narrative in role playing games. Um, and I don't remember who wrote that, but uh, they did. A, they have a section where they do some real good. What I would well, the kind of thing that I want to do at least of real detail, paying attention to line by line what people are saying, and how that affects things. Interesting. Oh, the other thing that anthropology can bring to the table with studying D and D, and I think can uh, can bring to the table for even if you're not studying D and D, but if you're just a, a a DM or a player, is just understanding comparative things and how how other cultures work and getting good on the ground descriptions. On the on the gaming side of things, I've drawn on lots of uh, ethnographic work and uh, descriptions of their cultures when I'm running the game so that if if there's like a, a tribe of lizard men like there are in my campaign right now that, that they've come across, then that shapes how I want to describe how those people um, interact. And not that I'm trying to be um, super realistic with it, but it, it shapes and, and flavors um, how I portray that. So uh, on that side of things. But then for the study of D&D, there are some cool parallels, things that I have come across um, in other cultures, because it's, it's a real unique thing that we do with D&D. As, as anthropologically speaking, I haven't ever talked to anyone who's able to say, oh yeah, and this other, there's this other example from Culture XYZ where they do this collaborative, interactive, oral storytelling that's governed by rules. Like, the combination of things that we do in role-playing games is, as far as I can tell, really, really unique. But there are some things that I found that are kind of parallel, and the coolest one to me right now, at least, um, and it's been the coolest to me for a few years now, is uh, this anthropologist named Keith Basso. He worked with the Western Apache, and he has this uh, awesome chapter in a book, and it's called uh, Wisdom Sits in High Places. And he describes um, how the Apache, the, the, the Apache model of wisdom, the Western Apache's model of wisdom, as he explains it, is first of all, it's, it's considered a journey that people go on throughout their lives. And it's understood that most people, you just hit that point where you're done. You're just not going to go any further. You're like, ah, I've, I've, I'm wise enough. But then the truly wise person is the person who keeps going their whole life. And what they keep going in is developing knowledge of stories connected to specific places in their uh, in the the area in which they live. So they have a, pretty much every notable location in the geography surrounding this this community has a specific name that's very descriptive, and they have a specific narrative that's associated with that place. And so this is when I'm thinking about D&D in place. I'm, I, this is how I came across this concept. But there'll, there'll be like, a, he opens it with this story about these kind of cattlemen that he'd been working with, that they're cowboys or, you know, whatever, on horses going out to do something with other animals. I'm not, um, I'm not real up on the uh, ranching lingo. Anyway, we're going to do some sort of... Uh, Cultural like or pastoral activity, and there's this there's this guy that was in the group. He'd not been around for a few weeks uh, because he was on a bender because this girl had jilted him and he'd been pursuing her and and she rejected him. So he was just you know passed out drunk for two or three weeks. Uh, and when he shows up, uh, it's kind of awkward because it's like he's been screwing them over for three weeks because he hasn't been helping, uh, and all of the tension gets diffused. Uh, someone just makes an offhand reference to this spot where two hills come together. And everyone laughs, and then it's fine, and, and they head off. And so, of course, Basso had to find out why they were, you know, why that worked. And what he found is that there's a story, uh, the, the, the story associated with the, the two hills there is that there were two beautiful women on the top of each hill, and I'm completely butchering the story, of course, but... There's two women at the top of each of these hills, or one woman at the top of each hill, and there's a guy who just spends all of his time going back and forth between them until, like, you know, mishap befalls him and he uh, falls off the mountain and dies. Or, <laughs> and as a result of chasing after these women walking back and forth. And so basically they're saying, like, 
is basically like, are you done doing what that guy did, and now you're ready to, to join up with us? And so they that diffused the tension. They were all able to hook up again and go out and do their stuff. And so what develops it, so for the Western Apache, Basso says that wisdom is having lots of those place and place story combinations developed, but specifically the the cool connection with D&D &D is that what they say the, the wise person does with that is whenever you're in a tough situation, you close your eyes or uh, mentally picture that story and that place, and you put yourself in the position of the person who's doing the wise thing. Uh, and so if you can kind of run through that in your head, then you can hopefully make a, a good decision or give good advice or whatever the situation is. And that's one of the closest things to uh, to that aspect of D&D &D that I've found. And so seeing those connections, and that's one of the things that's made me start to think that uh, our sense of place is really important when we're playing D&D. &D. Uh, and that same talk that I gave where I had the, the Chicago and the Greyhawk thing side by side, when the Greyhawk image came up, and for those of you who are here because you know anthropology and not D&D. &D. Uh, Greyhawk is one of the first um, dungeons ever created. It was made by Gary Gygax. So it's real, it's, you know, pretty well known. But I put I put it up on the end of the screen and I could hear um, uh, like a sharp intake of breath from someone in the room. And uh, they came up and talked to me afterwards and it was because they recognized that specific quadrant of the specific level of Greyhawk that I was showing them on the map, on the, on the screen, and all of, it's like all of the memories just rush back in on them of all of the things that they had done in that area. And so you, you develop these senses of attachment to these places, and they have a real existence, too. Uh, when I was at GaryCon, I think the GaryCon 3 that I, where I met Richard, Someone was telling me that they were playing a game with Rob Kuntz in his um, dungeon, uh, El Raja Key. And this is a dungeon that uh, all of the early creators of, and kind of big names in the game uh, had played in, or in, the, in the original incarnation. And they're walking down this corridor, and there's an elf, and so they, uh, they get kind of a you know, free roll to, the, to, to find the secret door. And they realize that there's a secret passage in this hallway, and it opens up, and they go. Uh, uh, they have some adventure down there. But what Rob tells them is that Gary Gygax and his party that played in originally walked down that corridor hundreds of times and never found that secret passage because they didn't have an elf with them. And so the idea that Rob would keep he wouldn't that he would just that treat this space as real and maintain that thing without anyone finding it or any guarantee that anyone will ever find it for 30 years or whatever um, just spoke volumes to me about the way that we that we relate to these fictional places. And I think ultimately that challenges our ideas about what it means for something to be fictional. So I don't remember how I got on this topic, but... <laughs> Anything that I should say about like anthropology more generally, or should I? Uh, anyone, I don't know what I don't know what kinds of things people want to talk about, or how long we want to talk about them. So, I had a quick question. Who's the um, who are you working with at Texas A and M? Uh, I'm working with. Uh, hold on, I'm just checking uh, Google Plus here to see if there's okay. I'm working with Tom Green. Thomas Green, um, and he's mostly known for, he's been editor on a, um, some folklore encyclopedias and done a lot of work that, and but his specific area of focus is martial arts, um, and a little bit with like these musicians and interactions between those, but um, he's most known for stuff with martial arts. Um, so, topic-wise, we don't have a lot of overlap. Although he's, you know, very supportive of D and D, or me of me studying D and D. Um, but theory, uh, on the theory side of things and how we like to approach the topics, we we see eye to eye really well, and uh, he's been real supportive. So, he's actually a very hands-off advisor. Uh, <laughs> 
which I've really come to appreciate. Uh, at first, <laughs> at first I'm, I'll go on the record as saying at first it kind of feels like he doesn't care about you at all. Because <laughs> it's like he's not, you know, you have all these expectations about what it means to have a grad advisor and then getting a PhD, and it means that they, like, control every aspect of your life and email you at 3 a.m. and... Uh, <laughs> um, and he just kind of is just unless he unless he wants to give a course correct and you're not going to hear from him. And uh, at first you feel neglected, and then you realize that it's uh, it's very it's, it's actually like this really intense show of support and kind of because you know that if he thought you were screwing up, then he would be all over you. And so when he's not talking to you, you know that he's um, <laughs> that works really well for me. I think other, other people might want a more hands-on advisor. <laughs> I really like this that we've got going. Uh, I also want to ask you if um, so. You you talk about narrative, and you talk about how we do storytelling, or how these D and D gamers or D and Ders—I don't know the right term—are using or telling stories. Um, what kind of like are anthropologists talking about stories right now? Very much like is that a is that a is that a in vogue topic. I mean, well, I think it is because that's what my dissertation's on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. I feel like if you go to the, the American Anthropological Association, I don't feel like you hear a lot of people talk, talking about story, caring about it as as story. They might be coming up with the uh, you know narratives of narratives of gender in post-Soviet Kazakhstan. Um, and those are narratives, um, but they're not narratives in the sense that, in the sense that people who are want to study narrative because of this very powerful human thing. Um, I, I think that I think that we're using the same words in slightly different ways. I don't think that a lot of anthropologists are really interested in story in the way that. Someone like Joseph Campbell means it, for example. Whether you agree with Campbell's analysis of story, there is this thing that story that um, one of my colleagues uh, listens to John Green. Uh, is that I think his name? This John Green is a like he does a lot of YouTube um, kind of just geek commentary stuff. Oh yeah, one, the brothers. Yeah, uh, one of the things that he says is that it seems very clear that humans, for whatever reason, are um, are wired to think that made up stories matter, um, and I don't feel like I feel like I mean I'm not uh, I'm not saying that there's no anthropologists that think about it, but I don't think it's at the core of what what anthropology cares about right now. Although it should be, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, this is what we're studying, but I think that what you have is the you have modernism, right? This idea that we're not telling stories when we do something like anthropology. We're doing science, meaning we're uncovering the secret laws of the universe and secret laws of humanity. And our understanding of those laws is going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the way that they actually are, that like the, the sort of God's eye view that we're able to establish. So you have that in the 19th and 20th century, and then all of a sudden, everyone realizes, oh, wait, no, we don't have it. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. And part of what we're doing when we, even when we tell, when we do science is we're telling stories. Even a chemist is in some ways telling a story or else we wouldn't care about it. Um, and I think that I misunderstood a lot of postmodernists when I first started reading them say that because I was like, I know, this is awesome. We're just telling stories all the time, and it's like the greatest thing ever. And I think that at least some postmodern theorists are like, no, no, this, this is terrible. Like, <laughs> this means that everything is a lie. Um, but, I, I mean, Ed, uh, Judith and I went to the same undergrad and uh, both worked with Kevin Piddle, and we were really trained right off the bat to understand that calling something a myth is a compliment. Um, and I think Definitely. that... Whether whether you call it whether calling something a myth is a compliment or an insult is a very determining determining factor on how someone is going to approach the study of culture or the study of humanity. 
Um, not having the grounding in anthropology that you guys do, could you explain how calling something a myth is a compliment? I mean, it, it has good connotations for me, but I don't have the grounding that you do. So, um, the way Wait, I would say, I mean... Okay. Nick, but, are yeah. you talking about how Kevin used to talk about sacred stories? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, okay. All right, I never mean, mind, go ahead. I mean, basically, I mean... And, I tend to use myth in like the, the broadest of all possible terms, at least when I'm most commonly using it. But uh, basically, to call something a myth is to, is to call it a story by which humans make sense of reality. Okay. I mean it. Um, and so the, to call science a myth um, is not to say that I think that science is false, but to say that it, it, it rises to the level that humans can orient themselves towards reality uh, in terms of it. I, I understand what you're saying. I think that's an issue with how we use language between the different sciences because, I mean, the whole stupid controversy about everything being a theory in science. Is just... Right. It's, a, it's comparable. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I can definitely see where you're coming from. Thank you for the uh, explanation there. Yeah. So uh, where would you say rules fall in the structure of this then? Because um, as a designer, that's part of my job is to give people the tools to do these kinds of things. I mean, even when I design board games and card games, I'm providing a framework for you to do whatever it is that you want to do within the context of the goal that you're trying to achieve for that particular game. Yeah, I think that the rules are... All right. Uh, actually, I think the way that, uh, to, the way to think about that is um, when I uh, again looking back to the my uh, my days as an undergrad, uh, there was a guy that um, was like a Plato scholar that I knew there, and I'm not a Plato scholar. Um, and this is not Dr. Reynolds, Judith. <laughs> uh, it's a guy named Jeff Lehman, actually. I don't and know. He. Uh, one of the things that he told me about Plato was that the most important thing about Plato is not any of the ideas that anyone in Plato actually says, but that the, the most important thing is that each dialogue of Plato is a, is a sort of just add people instant kit for having interesting conversations about important things. So it's kind of a, a jump start kit for interesting conversations uh, about, about major issues. And obviously the way that the the dialogue is structured is going to guide the kind of conversations you're going to be able to have or that, that it will lead you to have about justice or the nature of truth or whatever Plato wants to talk about. And so I think that when we look at a rule set, I think that thinking about it in terms of a, a jump start kit for, um, for making your own game uh, uh, is a, a good metaphor to have. So the rules structure the sorts of experiences that you're going to be able to have, but they are not in, in themselves the experience. And of course everyone's going to be tailoring the rules and house ruling and uh, even even if you're not doing a radical revision, you're always making callings on the fly um, of modifying the rules uh, in, in actual play. So uh, but no matter, even even if you house rule the heck out of a rule set, the initial statement of the rule set that someone like you develops, Richard, is um, it's a discourse that, that anything that someone does from that point forward has to be done in relationship to that rule set. If I put a target on a wall uh, and give someone a, a, a water gun or a paintball gun or whatever, and then tell them to shoot the shoot at the wall. They can decide not to shoot at the target, but what they can't do from that point forward is to decide not to shoot in relationship to the target. Um, and so, the the target that I put on the wall structures how they're going to be able to interact with with that space. And I think that a rule designer is someone putting a target on a wall, and that you can. Um, that people can react to that however they want, but you've you've kind of set the terms by which they can act in, a, in certain ways. So all of that will lead to certain kinds of story. Um, 
Yeah. Is that kind of what you're thinking of, or? Um, sorry, I lost part of the conversation. There was a glitch. I mean, it covers a lot of it, yeah, but I was thinking of it in terms of rules of story, not just so much yeah. of the framework. You know, yeah. I mean, I understand that it's kind of a basis from which I'm going, you know, like I'm, I'm directing the, the audience to, to take the material, but, you know, in, in regards to the storytelling process, even if I'm going to what kind of narratives can be told, but not just that, but also that I'm sort of suggesting a story that they can use. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's definitely true. Um, that the rules, so just the, I mean, the, the rules are going are gonna to determine what sorts of stories you can tell, or at least what sorts of stories you can tell well. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I, I, I've looked at before is changes in, if you, I, I, just taking Dragon Magazine and picking random uh, issues and then going through page by page and tallying up every time they reference uh, television, every time they reference a book, every time they reference a movie, a comic book, any other kind of media that's not gaming, and then tracking that over the years and like, so what what media are they referencing, and which books are they referencing? And uh, it would come, it will come as no surprise to someone who's familiar with the old school Renaissance that in the very early days. They're referencing pulp fiction, um, you know, uh, what one historian of fantasy calls um, uh, bracelet fantasy, in that like each episode is just like a link, uh, a bracelet, and you can re you could theoretically almost rearrange them however you wanted, uh, and then later they're referencing quest fantasy, where you've got this very defined plot arc of you know the kind of thing you learn in, in English class in high school. And I think that the rule set, I think that a lot of the rule changes you see in, like, around the Dragonlance era in the 90s. Is that the 90s? No, it was uh, late 80s. Late 80s, yeah, late 80s, early 90s, depending on, yeah. So um, I think that what you see partially there is people more and more being interested in those, those typographic plot arcs and I think that the rule set that they had wasn't letting them tell those the way that they wanted to. Um, and so they had to change the rules to get the kind of story that they wanted to get out of it. So I think that a lot of times when people are arguing over story in our community, really what they're arguing about is it's not like there's there's people who, even if, even if as part of rhetoric they might say, like, oh, I don't care about story in my game. I think they do still care about story in some way or another, and it's just what kind of stories are we going to want to tell, and how do the rules support or get in the way of that? Hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't know, it's, it's hard to tease out the connection between the rules and the story sometimes. Uh, but I just ran a game of Call of Cthulhu last night, and I noticed how differently I run that game without even thinking about it. it to, to me, Call of Cthulhu compared to what I normally run, which is, uh, well, Adventure Conqueror King right now, but like just basic D&D, old school D&D. Um, uh, Call of Cthulhu is very, for me, very more like performative, and like I, I find myself like using voices and stuff way more, for example, uh, and just make my decisions much more concerned over a narrative than simulation, if you're going to use those uh, terms, which are useful to some extent. Um, and I, I couldn't always, I mean, I think, I feel like if you look at Call of Cthulhu, it looks really fiddly. I mean, the character sheet's full of numbers. Um, but for some reason, that tends to, at least when I play it, promote a very, uh, a very theatrical almost mode of play. Whereas when I play old school D and D, um, the the uh, the story kind of happens after the fact. Like we when we're playing the game, it's like we're not even making the story. Then the story doesn't exist until afterwards when we're out on the front porch smoking and then reflecting on it and being like, oh man, that can you imagine just what you know? You know what just happened? 
And sometimes it's, you know, longer than that until we kind of piece all these weird roles and outcomes together into a story, and sometimes it's much shorter. But the all of that's structured by the rules, I think. Well, and you have um, enjoyed contrasting original rules with fourth edition. Yeah. I mean, and, that's... and you've talked about there was a difference there. Yeah, and I don't want to, I mean, it's a, it's still a tender topic, I think, in the gaming community as a whole, but I just know from my personal experience, when I started, when I, I started, I started gaming when I first played D&D, it was 3.5, and then I switched to 4th edition very enthusiastically, and then uh, a year or two after I started playing 4th edition, I, uh, I found uh, Grognardia, James Malachowski's blog, and I think I'm saying his name wrong, and I apologize, James, if you ever hear this. Um, but uh, that then I got turned on to old school D and D, and so I started thinking, well, maybe I can start tweaking fourth edition to to play more like how I'm hearing these things described. And maybe, as I, I've heard people say that they've had success with that. I know that in my personal experience, I, the more I tried to bend it to have the kind of experience that I was looking for, uh, then the more the the more things started to fall apart in my campaign. And so fourth edition was very to to me it felt like you could shift it, but that the rules really guided you towards a certain kind of experience, which wasn't the one that I wanted to have. Um, at least most of the time, it wasn't the one I wanted to have. And like I say, other people have uh, maybe they're for whatever reason they've been able to pull that off, but uh, for the most part, I wasn't able to. But it's definitely a difference in the story. And it's a more structured story. Yeah, I think so. At least a lot. Uh, yeah, I think that there there are things hard coded into the way that the the, the books are written that are going to lead you to tell stories in a different way. And that that I mean that typographic plot arc that I described is written into the advice on how to run a campaign, if not the rules. At, at the very least, it's written into the advice on how to run a campaign. I had I was thinking about stuff you said at the very beginning about um, um, game playing and storytelling and such, and then the life histories of of uh, is D and D or the same the right term? I or, think uh, probably just gamer. But the, gamer, okay. An ambiguity because gamer also can is the same word you use for video game players. So I don't know. Okay. I usually use gamer. Okay, so. Uh, the life histories of, of of a gamer. I was I was thinking about connect like that with what you said about the construction or the sort of the social construction of these stories. Um, have you found I don't know how many interviews you've done or whatever. Have you found that people with um, basically people of an older generation are they constructing a different kind of story in general, or um, or is it pretty? Is it, are, are, are the differences um, not meaningful or not significant if we want to talk about p values I think that uh, I think that there are differences I, I don't know that I could pin down exactly what they are but uh, most of the people that have been playing for a long time that were there at the beginning um, like when I inter when I talk to Tim Cask or see any of these sort of old guard, original type folks um, at a convention there is a difference of and I think that they have as the people who started this really big paradigm shift of a different way I mean what's really uh, you have a really strong case to say it's a whole new type of play that's never existed before um, as the people who were like there when all of that was when the iron was still hot, so to speak, um, I think they have a confidence that people who weren't there originally um, are maybe. Uh, I think that part of the old school renaissance is, is people more widely just rediscovering that confidence uh, to play with how narrative is done, <coughs> and that's not to say that. I mean, of course, that's a generalizing statement, so it's going to be incorrect. Uh, 
uh, at least um, yeah, I think that there are differences. I'm still trying to peg down exactly what those are. And it's hard to um, get at uh, what a, uh, someone who's gaming now who's been playing for 35 years or 40 years, it's really hard, of course, talking to them to find out what they the, the, what they actually were thinking about narrative 35 years ago and what they're retroactively thinking about what they thought about narrative. <laughs> and anthropologists were, are really interested in, in the ways that, of course, that the, the stories we tell about our past are ways for understanding the present. And so it's not like I have to worry too much about uncovering the sort of honest-to-God truth uh, as much as thinking about the ways that the stories we're telling about the past are, are shaping them. Um, although uh, that book that I was talking about, John Peterson's book, um, does lean more towards giving a, a real objective account that I can then kind of bounce other um, kind of folk histories off of. So I don't know anything about this uh, Renaissance thing you were talking about because when, when I hear Renaissance, I, I think of like Michelangelo, which was a really big moment for humans. But it sounds like the Renaissance you're talking about is a whole different kind of big moment for humans. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> man. Um, so. Don't worry. I know what you're talking about when you talk about gear. It's just not this stuff. Yeah. It's kind of funny. The Zach's whole idea with this was for within the gaming community uh, that we have on Google Plus for like these various experts to talk about their things, and it's going at least as much the other direction <laughs> of uh, 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 exporting our culture out to other people. <laughs> uh, and it also puts me in a position of of possibly. Uh, telling the story wrong. And as an anthropologist, I'm real concerned with, even though I'm a member of this culture, <laughs> of issues of representation. But basically, kind of the story is that you have uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arnold. They started D&D. Um, they both passed away within a, about a year of each other, uh, like four years ago, four or five years ago. And right around that time, um, probably partially caused by it, uh, you have people more and more starting to think about hey, what about the way that we played the game, that the game was played in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and so that came to be this uh, going back to the kind of first things and um, subsequently also reimagining other courses that the history might have taken. Uh, calling it old school renaissance school revival OSR um, and it's a, it's a, <laughs> this is one of the first books in that, uh, uh, no seriously this is actually one of the things he's talking about yeah. oh okay <laughs> yeah. so it's a, a growing sort of there's lots of aspects to it but it's basically the under underlying thing is people trying to uh, go back to the way that the um, that the game was played in the in the 70s and maybe early 80s, depending on where they draw the line. Uh, and I guess one way to explain it to you is the uh, it's basically in the gaming culture for a long time the assumption was very similar to unilineal cultural evolution, in that we're just getting better all the time. Every new rule set is going to is going to be better than the last one. Um, and then part of the old school Renaissance is about questioning that. Um, and thinking, well, this is different, but it might not be better. Um, and maybe both of both kinds of things are good in their own right. Would you, um, do you know, uh, I don't know, Kevin taught this class, um, and, and I took it at one point, about new religious movements, and we talked a ton about Anthony F.C. Wallace's uh, revitalization movements, um, and then in Kevin's religion class. Would you characterize it as being somewhat like a revitalization movement? Yeah, I think definitely. Okay. So, for uh, for the the uh, to, to talk to the other side <laughs> uh, of of the participants for a second, Anthony S. C. Wallace is this really cool guy who studied uh, well, like she said, new new, uh, new religious movements. But specifically, one of the things that he did is he looked at the stages through which and the formation of a religion or any kind of movement tends to go, 
And one of the key things that happens, usually upon the death of the founder, is that um, there's this kind of back to the old ways sort of movement um, where people want to go back to the first things and kind of get back the vital spirit that was there at the birth of whatever movement you're talking about. And so it's not coincidental that all of this old school <clears throat> stuff that we've been doing for the past four or five years uh, lined up with, with Gygax and Artisan's passing. Um, oh. And Wallace kind of predicted that. I mean, not like he was talking about D&D, &D, but it fits his model really, really well. Yeah, the, actually two, two examples. The first one I held, this is uh, what's known as a, a clone of first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and it's essentially the the rule books or the first three rule books for that, and then this was a um, redux of uh, what's called zero edition, the original box set. And so, you, the, right off the bat, you have people just trying to get like an exact simulacra, and then people start talking about second wave retro clones, which are kind of like these imagined, uh, reimagined uh, alternate histories of. That was going to be my next question, was imagined um, histories. Um, and, yeah, and and so in that case, what I mean is that they'll say, they'll say well, in, in the, like, I can't remember the, the who, whose project this is exactly. Uh, well, I'll use the example that I know better. Um, with uh, the Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game that uh, Joseph Goodman put out, um, it's an alternate history uh, in the sense that um, part of the thought experiment was what if we had all of the gaming mechanics that we've invented now and we um, and we were trying to do what Gygax said he was trying to do, which was simulate a specific set of literature. And so using all the mechanics we have now, um, it's almost like a... a Mechanically speaking, it's almost like a steampunk sort of thing of like using the like mixing the the, the technologies and things from different time periods. Another thing that I've seen going along with that for your question on the second wave, there's somebody who's trying to recreate what would have been second edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons had Gary Gygax remained with TSR. That's the, one, that's the one I thought of first, actually, and I couldn't remember who was yeah, doing Yeah, I don't it. either. But uh, based on his notes, trying to think of, well, what if Gary had been the guy who made second edition and he hadn't gotten kicked, uh, been booted from the company? And there was a whole bad political uh, side to the street. Um, real, real rough and controversial, but um, basically, what if Gary was there when they wrote the second edition D&D and he shaped it? So those kinds of thought experiments people are doing. Hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? Anything they want to go on about? I will say too. I guess uh, I have a website um, uh, for people outside of uh, academia. There's a oh, I have the chat things in here. Oh, okay. Uh, called academia.edu, and I'll probably post it in my timeline or something. But what, academia, I, I've got some of my papers about D and D up on uh, on that website, on my profile for it. Um, and the one, the one, the one that's going to be in general popular culture is in there right now, and that is about um, looking at the history of D and D in terms of a tension between rationalization and improvisation. And so, in almost every rule book that you guys look at, if you take off your shelf uh, like and grab a, a rule book at random. Somewhere in the introduction, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to say something along the lines of, the only limit to this game is your imagination, some variant thereof. That's very true. But then for 300 pages or 70 <laughs> pages, or 80 pages, however, I mean, if it's, even if it's just two pages, what they're going to set out to do then is to provide a set of rules to structure your imagination. And so there's this tension that we have at the very heart of gaming between this free play of the imagination 
and putting rules and, and controls on that. And I think that that's a I think that that's a very productive tension uh, that that drives what we do. Um, but at different times in the history of the game and the history of the hobby, people are are siding one way or the other uh, and privileging rationalization over over imagination or vice versa. And uh, in social and like kind of theory academic um, uh, techno babble, uh, there's a guy uh, Max Weber who people have probably heard of. Um, he wrote a really awesome book called <laughs> Capitalism, where he described the whole history of the West from like John Calvin forward as this process of increasing rationalization, that uh, everything is becoming more and more regimented and um, kind of the boxes are getting drawn ever tighter. And so the idea that that D and D by combining those things together might uh, might provide a way to kind of resist against the uh, hyper rationalization or what, what he calls the irrational irrationality of rationality is what happens. Um, I think that's one of the things that D and D does really well. So that's what that paper is about: is that looking at that tension, um, which I think you can see going all the way back to the very beginning. Um, even even before D and D, if you even if you just look at H. Uh, G. Wells' Little Wars, uh, where he describes the in, uh, his in, invention of a little of his little war game that they had, I think just in the short time frame that he describes, you can see that he's having to work through those tensions of we want to have a really imaginative game, but we're doing it together, so we have to come up with these rules. But we don't want too many rules because that seems really unfun. And so I think that's a tension that we all always have, and that we shouldn't ever seek to finally resolve um, that, that push and pull. So academia.edu has those in it who are interested in actually looking at them. And I've been meaning, I have some other manuscripts I've been meaning to put up there um, as well that I'll be submitting to different journals, but that's the only one that's going to be in a journal. But they have a two-year delay right now, so that's awesome. Um, so you were talking about rationalization and improvisation, and it totally reminded me, there's this article in um, American Anthropologist last March um, that was about um, creativity and, like, rules in a jazz music program. Oh, yeah. Did you hear about it? No, what's the guy's, uh, is it a guy that wrote it? Because I know that there's I don't know. It's uh, E-I-T-A-N, and the last name is W-I-L-F. I don't think that that is... Uh... Called Rituals of Creativity. Um. Yeah, that's one, that's one thing that anthropologists have written about, is that, like, they'll talk about jazz improv or, like, improv theater. And yeah. You get some of the same things going on that you have in gaming, but they almost never have it as explicit of rules as we have, mm -hmm. but a lot of the things are still going on. Well, in this article, he, she is talking about um, how through these, these new technologies in which, they're, in which they have digital recordings of these great performances by great jazz masters, and then the students listen to it and are supposed to play along with it, basically. So it's like complete imitation, and yet there's there's the overall sort of rhetoric of improvisation and creativity that's going along. And it's, uh, when I run D&D, uh, I really, I, I almost always use the, the like, pre-written modules, uh, which is, some people like the sign uh, like, not creative at all, which is probably true. But, <laughs> Uh, I think that there's the, the there's a fun there's a lot of fun to be had in riffing off of set structures like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a it's a direct comparison to the the bad, bad jazz example is a direct comparison to to what we do in D and D. But I think jazz is closer than improvisational theater because so. in in improv theater you just kind of give them a line and throw them out there. But um, jazz, you've got to stay within the musical structure. They do have some rules that are that you 
the, this article that I read once that was um, it, it talks about rules they have like and some of them are the same rules that we actually have for how to be a good DM. Um, the one that the one that's the most similar is never say no. Yep. Uh, and so in improv theater, you're not supposed to like someone be like, oh, here's uh, you know have a call, you know here uh, someone's on the phone for you, and be like, that's not a phone, it's a banana. Like you're not supposed to do that because it. It breaks the game. It, or, yeah, it breaks the game and it ends the ends the movement, and then there's nothing you can do after it. Yeah, and so that's the exact same rule that every advice guide for DMs uh, ever written has in there. Is uh, you don't say no, you say yes, but. Um, so I think there's a lot of parallels. And there's another one that um, if you don't know, make it up and uh, write it down later so that way you don't like have to worry about it. it. Like whatever happens in the moment happens for the story and any changes. And then the other one that kind of goes along with that is uh, if you don't know, flip a coin. Yeah. <laughs> Roll the dice. Literally, it says it's it, you bake, basically bring it down to an e either or choice if you don't know what else to do. So I'm not sure if the jazz uh, thing quite fits. I mean, I understand where you're going with that because it. I mean, there is kind of a, this aspect of riffing off of one another. Cause like mm -hmm. when I run a game, I always make my own adventures. I've actually never run a module, and in my thirty some odd years of gaming, I have never run one. <laughs> Which is kind of uh, kind of funny because I've seen them, I've bought a couple of them, I've just never run them. But um, like one of the things you can do is just prepare a bunch of material that's uh, loosely structured or, or more of just like a series of encounters and let the players do whatever they want. So whatever happens, happens, but it has nothing to do with any plan or any story that takes place just so that way you can try your hand at like just doing freeform gaming and not having to look things up as you go as well. Yeah, but I, I need, and I think that there is a certain degree to which you have to have some kind of structures on, on creativity, whether those are internally imposed or you kind of externalize them in the form of dice or whatever, like in random generation. Uh, and one of the things I really, really would like to do sometime is uh, there's uh, some good work in uh, cognitive psychology about creativity and how limitations produce creativity. And so I actually have an experiment that I had to write up for this class that I've, I probably won't be able to implement for anything until after my dissertation, if ever. Although I'd like to do it. Um, but basically the idea would be to um, have uh, sets of people come up with uh, NPC descriptions, uh, non-player characters uh, for the uh, the uninitiated, uh, and uh, so everyone just would be you know they'd be given an index card or whatever and, and uh, ask them to just to, to write up a short three to five sentence description of this character, uh, and so everyone would be doing that the same, but you would vary the amount of parameters that you would give the person probably just using like the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, where you're rolling through those different characteristics. And so, like, what kind of descriptions does someone produce if they have complete freedom? Uh, you know, what if they have one restraint, two restraints, three restraints, and maybe do, like, between one and seven or something like that? Mm -hmm. And then have people, a separate group of people, rate the creativity of those player of those NPCs that were created and maybe start to hone in on, like, what... The, the level of res restraint that tends to produce the most creativity, and I think that's something that would be really useful if you can if we can start honing like coming up with somewhat scientific understandings of those kinds of things. I feel like that would help someone like you a lot, Richard, if you're trying to write a module. And I know that uh, if you watch um, Grognardia, James lately has been doing something really similar, or he's been thinking about these kind of questions a lot lately. When he'll post like here's some NPC descriptions. Do you think that this is too much description, not enough description? I'm going to be including it in the, in, you know, this, uh, in the Dwemer Mount publication. And so he's been, a lot of what you have to tweak is how much description am I going to, am I going to give of this specific place to spark people's creativity without bogging them down in details. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we could probably uh, start to hone in on that a little bit I don't normally do like real quantitative experiments like that, 
but I think that some of them that, that would be helpful. I'll I, help you. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another question. Um, in in regards to your studies, are you looking at this entirely from just the perspective of D and D? Are you applying this to other role playing games, or are you doing it by addition, anything like that? I I decided pretty early on that I was just to, for the sake of carving out and saying this is just to draw boundaries that I was just gonna focus on D and D. I actually have I have recordings from Gary Khan where I played in. Uh, a fire or I mean a Serenity game. I think I might have one other as well. And I run lots of stuff, but for the dissertation, I'm just using. I'm just focusing on on D and D or, you know, like D and D variants, like like you know all the retro clones and stuff. Um, yeah, not because I not because I think that it's inherently. Well, I guess there is a sense in which. Um, what's a, there's a sense of like trying to establish a baseline understanding or looking at other things because uh, everything obviously has to be re reacting against D and D in some way or another. So laying like trying to get real robust understandings of just D and D first, I think, is important. In the same way that I'm also not looking, which is kind of crazy as an anthropologist, I'm not looking at other cultures either because obviously more people than Americans play D&D, but I'm only going to be in America for my field work. Although this semester I'm actually working on a paper about D&D um, &D, uh, &D and role-playing game history in Spain. I'm going to look at um, the, my, my buddy Tavis, who you probably met Tavis at GaryCon, uh, yeah. Tavis Allison. Um, yeah. he, uh, he was telling me about... He talked to, I want to say it was some Scandinavian gamers. And he, they were describing how the some of the default assumptions that they have for a campaign were very different from American assumptions. And so um, the, almost every campaign, that, according to these people telling Tavis this at least, um, involved people writing really long character backgrounds. like you know, five to seven pages of, of wow. character biography. Uh, and, then the, and then the dungeon master's job was to figure out how to integrate all of those into a story. And there are there are definitely Americans who do that. Um, but if that really is um, a much more common style of play, then you start to ask, like, well, why are these differences existing there? And that's where anthropology can jump in. So that's something I want to do eventually. Um, for example, like, I mean, looking at Spain... They didn't get they their first role playing game published in Spanish was uh, basic I think Menser basic, um, and then you know so like which which thing came to a, a country first is going to determine things but then also there's pre existing assumptions about uh, about what story is and what games are uh, that are going to shape the way that people play are, are going to develop these games and I know uh, I chose Spain because partially because I found a Spanish journal. <laughs> That. Also because, um, people, I've been seeing people talking about it in American circles more. Uh, some of those those Spanish games, Aventuras uh, in La Marca Este, or something like that. Adventures in the East Marches, um, Battle Ground, and they they seem to be having. They seem to be. Uh, there seems to be a lot going on over there in Spain right now, and so it'd be, it's it's interesting to look at the comparisons eventually. So yeah, but now, that's, that's what I'm saying, is that for now, for my dissertation, I'm just focusing on America, and even within that, I'm just focusing on D&D, &D. and I'm almost, and I probably won't have much to say about 4th edition, <laughs> really. Um, except, I mean, I, in that I probably won't record a single session of 4th edition D&D &D unless one of the groups I end up doing field work with happens to be playing it. And there's a, a German uh, role-playing game that you might be interested in. It's a, its own system completely, but it's uh, billed as, a, as an old-school role-playing game. It's called Dungeon Slayers. There's even an English translation of it. Interesting. And it's free. I, I ran across it uh, once um, in speaking with somebody online about various old school style games and 
given that I can speak German, uh, it was it was kind of cool to actually run across something like that. But uh, I, I thought you, you know you might be interested in it. And I'm not sure how much it would uh, fit into like looking at different styles. But it's really you know in terms of the mechanic structure, it has this really old school feel like some of the stuff that you were describing for the retro clones. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really interesting, um, especially because uh, Germany is kind of where it all started. Uh, in Prussian war gaming, yeah, uh, Kriegspiel. So, uh, I think that they, I, I feel like that would be an especially interesting study. And uh, well, you know, Kriegspiel, then uh, Little Wars, and then Gary. I mean, that's pretty much the the evolution of D and D. Yeah, those are the. I mean, definitely, you're going to draw three points. Um, but yeah, if anyone, if anyone is not that's that, that is a gamer at least, uh, is not planning on reading Play at the World, then I definitely recommend it because seeing there's just so much, uh, so much richness to um, what happens and things getting lost and rediscovered, and it's really cool. Yeah. Here's a very uninformed question. Um, are, did D&D, &D, are they sort of the, those games, the uh, birthplace of modern-day MMORPGs? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Oh, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> and not even just MMORPGs, but um, almost any game where a character can get hit multiple times before they die, and certainly any game where... You have a character that gets better over the uh, over multiple plays. So this happens in like Call of Duty or racing games now. Man. All of that owes uh, owes uh, its popularity to D and D. D and D isn't the first game to come up with each of those different things, but is the first game to put them all together and make them widely known enough to to forever and abase everything else. On it. Yeah, basically the experience point system that you find now, I mean, it's ubiquitous, but it's it's basically Dungeons and Dragons. That's where that came from. And uh, like with the um, MMOs, the first uh, text-based uh, adventure game, it was just called Adventure or Colossal Cave Adventure. The guy who wrote it, I mean, it's even on uh, various websites. Uh, Julian Dibble did an article about this in I think the late 90s, early 2000s about... Uh, this whole concept, but uh, the guy that created it, William Crowther, worked for BBN, which was the company that was uh, tasked to help develop the equipment for the internet, while he was working on the first multiplex router, which was called Pluribus. He developed a Colossal Cave Adventure, and he and there's a quote that he talks about this. He attributes the success of all of this, his ideas, from playing Dungeons & Dragons. Which is why there's such a close link to the structure of how the the internet is and uh, and uh, the rule structures for Dungeons and Dragons and I mean, like Nick was talking about we you know this is something he and I have talked about before I mean it's it's really I mean it's it's kind of eerie when you look at it how close in terms of parallels for information theory that role playing games share with things like libraries and the internet. It's, I think it definitely has a structure the way that we think about things. Um, one of the things, we're talking about experience point systems, though, that brings up um, a point that I think is worth talking about. One of the influences that gaming is having on the culture at large right now is in the, the concept of gamification. So if you've ever heard of <laughs> fitocracy, I don't, how, do, you guys, do you ever pronounce that word before? Do you say fitocracy or fitocracy? Fitocracy. Anyways, okay. are any of those things where it's like do chores and you'll get experience points and level up, or you know run and you'll get points and it'll say that you're awesome. Um, all of that tied into gamification, and one of the one of the problems I have with gamification and what I hope that that gamers that that uh, tabletop role playing gamers uh, will be able to kind of be able to more and more put their voice in and that hopefully some small way my research contributes to is challenging the idea that the most important thing about games, because gamification is the idea that, wow, look, people are really motivated to play games. There's something about them that just motivates human action. 
and we want to harness that for other things. Uh, one of the problems I think is that they think that the easiest thing to, to harness is the experience point type of system, that quantified aspect. But I don't think that that's really what's motivating us, or at least at the very least, I don't think that's the thing we want to have motivating us. Um, uh, and I think that the the narrative aspects of of gaming are really the things that that if you really want to have a a good version of gamification, you're going to have to figure out how to narrativize the thing. Think about the relationship between. I mean, getting getting. I mean, maybe it works for some people, but getting experience points for cleaning my house doesn't does nothing for me. Um, there's got to be a narrative. There's got to be like some sense of progress, of like why I, why I should care about that because I already care about cleaning my house, like, and I don't do it. And so, <laughs> throwing experience points in there isn't going to make me clean my house, at least for me. So I think I have to be more careful thinking about. The relationship between those things. And I got a couple of books for you for that. There's a really cool blog too called "Playing at the Past," um, and if uh, for people that are, uh, especially if you're ever going to teach something or uh, like teach a class, these people that design their entire course as a as a role playing game or some sort of immersive thing. I can't remember uh, any of the people involved in it, but the, the one that always stuck out to me was a Latin class where the fundamental assumption of the game was that you had all been sent to this villa for three or four months to learn how to grow up and be proper Latin uh, citizens and then about learning the language and about learning the culture. So I thought about actually teaching an anthropology class where uh, it would be a set of scenarios where it's... Uh, and there, I, the, I've had trouble thinking about it. I'm still trying to narrow down how I'd want to do it. And it it's a long ways off, but I think I'd want to base them all on actual historical anthropological encounters. So take Bronislav Malinowski uh, in the Trobrians and tell this class, all right, there's 20 of you, you're on this island, um, here's the layout, here's the geography of the island, there's the, the missionaries uh, are living here, the colonial authorities living here, this is where the village is. If you live with the, the colonial authority and the missionaries, you probably won't get. You probably have. You won't get sick as easily, and uh, you'll probably be less depressed. Um, but or you can live among the islanders and give them all these choices, and to to draw on role playing mechanics as much as possible for that. You do that for two or three weeks, and then you like wrap up and talk about you know the the different ways that it went with the actual historical event. And I have a couple out of, to draw on games to do that. Hmm couple of books that might help you in regards to that. Um, a Theory of Fun for Game Design by Raf Koster. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. But it's it's really cool. Um, the way it's structured, half of the book is illustrations for the concepts that he's trying to describe. So, like, you have text on one side and illustrations on the other. And uh, Jane McGonigal's uh, Reality is Broken. Yeah, see, McGonigal, and I, I'll admit I haven't read the book, Um when I first heard her TED talk, I was really excited, and then the more I thought about it, the more I was disturbed by the implications because it seemed at least, and I don't know, maybe it's just the way that people are applying her ideas. Because, like I said, never actually read it. Yeah. But, um, some of it starts to bother me and, and seem, um, yeah, I think I, I haven't been able to put my finger on exactly why, but I think it has to do with that rationalization. And, and and free play the imagination thing, it feels very much like let's just tighten the screws, figure out a way to tighten the screws a little bit more sometimes. I'm not sure if, if that's, um, you know, well, if that's what she's going for in the book. When I read it, I got out of it, like, the, the whole concept of gamification and using terms to describe some of the reasons why people enjoy it. Like, you were talking about the experience points for cleaning your house. And so she goes into some of the aspects of that, of, like, you know, the, the different levels of fun that you can have. Like, you know, the like fun in terms of Fiera or, you know, like, you know the joy of beating your friends. Or, you know, the, you know, like if you've mastered a game, you know, teaching somebody else how to play it. And, you know, you know, since you've pretty much beat it, there's no real fun to ha be had with it anymore. But if you can teach somebody else how, how to play it, you can kind of uh, 
you know, somehow gain some fun from watching them improve from your help and then also watching your friends play just to watch them play, you know, just to cheer them on. And like, so like in the same way, I guess, as watching your favorite sports team. Yeah. You know, so there's these. She talks about these different types of uh, structures of fun and and like some of the terminology that's used. So I thought, you know, for that that reason alone, it might be interesting to you. And you know, exploring this concept of gamification, you know, for why that that's kind of come out. And and uh, she's even developed some programs and games based around uh, stuff like that, like where she talks about where she uh, ended up with a concussion that lasted quite some time, and she did a game that had some kind of story behind it of like it, and it helped her get better you know like of uh, like being a super person or something like that and like the challenges of trying to conquer the different uh, aspects of uh, the the problems from that particular type of concussion that she had cuz the the effects lasted for months yeah and i think that she I, I almost certainly uh, if there's more there's more angles to it than um, uh, than i that I'm aware of, but the, one of the other things that, that, that just uh, you reminded me of is that obviously, I mean, she's right. McGonagall is right. There's a lot of awesome things that we can do by applying games to other things. But there's a there's a an assumption that she might not be making, but I think a lot of people are making when they hear her say that, which is that until we apply that to helping someone who's uh, terminally ill or until we apply games to help solve cancer or world hunger or whatever, then until that point we're not doing anything important. We're just playing games. And uh, that's, that's where, like, I'll get, I'll, I'll, you know, grab a big stick or something. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that she thinks that. Um, no, I didn't get the sense from that. I think that that's when people hear it. I think that's what they the the uh, they already have that idea, and so they just continue to roll with it and apply her stuff with that faulty assumption. I think one part of the book when I read it was about that and you know, this concept that games aren't work, and I think she was trying to address that. But it, it's been almost a year since I read it, so. But I mean, like you, I was just bringing it up because I thought it'd be interesting in some. No, of I agree. It is a really good. It's a, it's a really important book to engage with for sure. And it's really, and I got she's got just the just that concept in general is really powerful. Hi, my name is I'm a sponsor here in the Philippines with my commission. Would you help me buy a newspaper subscription? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 wow. That was like straight out of up. <laughs> 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 that was someone at my door. <laughs> We, we, we intuited that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you live alone, you're the only one who can get the door, so. <laughs> oh. Well. Um, anything else? Let me look real quick. Uh, you guys think if you have any other things that you guys want to talk about. I was going to ch double check and make sure that there wasn't something someone asked me to talk about on the event and then I just ended up ignoring them. Uh, I think the term for gamers, that you know, for role-playing gamers, I think it would just be role-players. That's the okay. term I've generally heard because D&D &D is specific. Players, yeah, because yeah, D&D &D is specific to, to the game itself, but people who play RPGs in general, like if they're, if, you know, like, depending on if they are uh, strictly role-playing game enthusiasts or if they play other games, you know, might call themselves gamers or role-players specifically. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, I found two things that were on the event thing that I have accidentally ignored. And one of the guy, the guy who dropped in, Aristotle, uh, asked about enagrams, which I had not heard of at all. Have you guys heard of that? E -N -N -A -G -R -A -M. Which? E-N-N-A-G-R-A-M. Engrams, yeah. Oh, is that? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, Story-based characters using personality types. I think that you could definitely do that. Uh, and I think that another place to look. I don't. I don't know much about story gaming. Um, 
uh, as a movement, and like I don't know many story games, but I think that doing something based on union archetypes would be really cool. Um, but the other thing that someone asked about was that I actually have something to say about is uh, the relationship between D and D and folklore mythology. Not like the study of those things, but the things themselves, because obviously D and D is drawing on all of these folklore tropes and myth tropes. And actually, um, the book that I was talking about, John Peterson's book, is one of the, that's one of the things that he's really made me uh, the gears I've been turning on, because he traces he does something that I've been wanting to do for a while, which is to take a specific uh, fantasy figure or a fantasy race, like elves or dwarves or orcs, and he traces it as far back as he can go, uh, and he does that with a few different things. And the thing that was most awesome to me that, that John pointed out in this book is that uh, you have this tradition in the Middle Ages of bestiaries, right? You have all these big books full of all different animals. And mixed in with the animals, of course, are like fantastic creatures. And so you have that going on. And then you have all of these different uh, orcs or goblins um, are actually a really one of the better ways of demonstrating this point that he makes of you have this concept of there are these people or there's this there's this yeah there's these other people who live under the ground and they're kind of scary and they might take you or take your kids or something you have this kind of real general concept uh, and that concept is independently innovated in places but it's also transmitted and a lot of the different names that we have that are different fantasy races in D&D, kobolds, goblins, orcs, hobgoblins, whatever, the goblinoid family, um, is um, the, the reason that the, all those different names exist. Gnolls is another one. Kobold, or uh, even, even gnomes and dwarves are sometimes mixed up in this, in the source material, is because it's moving from language to language, and it, the, the name changes as it, as it enters a new language, and then they later re-encounter the old name, and then they're like, well, how are these different? But basically you have the situation where there's this, all of these vague descriptions that are not very codified of... If, uh, and another example is in the, the Poetic Edda, which is the Norse um, kind of epic uh, myth cycle. Uh, there's a section where they talk about dark elves and the, 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 if you read the commentaries on it then they'll say we're not sure if he actually if these were elves that lived under the ground or if this was just a weird way of talking about dwarves we don't know if dwarves and elves were the same thing if they were different things or if you go to England the difference between elves and fairies if there's a difference there or not so you have all of these terms floating around that are real muddy uh, and no one really and in one sense, no, obviously, no one cared to to codify it because no one did. If they if they cared about it, then they would have. And so then you get you get all the way up to. I mean, even if you look at Lord of the Rings and, and Tolkien, um, there's a lot of like the difference between a goblin and an orc. In the Hobbit, he usually says goblin. In the Lord of the Rings, he usually says orc. Um, but the the knife orcrist. Uh, we're told that Orchrist means goblin flare. So there's this, like, are goblins and orcs the same things or different things? And uh, So even up into the literature that Gygax is have, trying to make a game out of, it's all of this fuzzy stuff. And so what Peterson points out is that um, Gygax is working in this bestiary tradition of, I mean, if you look at the monster manual, it's a bestiary. And... Uh, he actually is able to trace. There's a specific one that Gygax, we can almost be certain, had his hands on. Uh, uh, for, because, uh, for example, in D&D, a gorgon is a m metal bull um, that breathes poisonous vapors, and it's not um, a woman, a female figure with snakes on her head that turns people into stone, which is like the Greek thing. And it's because... Mm -hmm. It's partially because the the bestiary that that Gygax had uh, that's how it described a gorgon, um, but so Gygax is taking all of the source material and then because it has to be a simulation game now, um, then a goblin can't or an orc can't be both a giant uh, uh, 
a giant with only one eye and uh, a little green guy and a whale, all of which are things that are orcs are in the source materials of medieval and ancient folklore. It can't be all three of those things in D and D because we have to give it a hit dice and we have to, um, you know, tell how hard it hits and so forth. And so because of because it's entering into a game world now, it has to get codified. So in certain ways, the monster manual takes this existing tradition and then like one ups it and really like sets a pattern going forward. And in anthropology, uh, one of my colleagues uh, who works in works with the Japanese stuff, um, I'm totally going to mess up the name. There's a whole tradition in Japan of uh, making these sort of monster manual type things as well, bestiaries. But uh, uh, these ones are specifically just fantastic creatures. Um, sure. And so that seems to, it seems to be a very human thing to do, or at least more than one culture has done it. And it's interesting the way that the, the project of doing it as part of a game shaped shaped it. So that's one of the... I think that's... You know, talking about where D&D fits in in folklore and mythology, which is the question um, I think it was John Johnson posted, that it, it draws on all of these things, but it has to shape them because what we're doing with it is different. We're not just telling stories um, with it. We have to be agreeing about stories between multiple people who are telling a story together. Um, so on the one hand, D&D is a very unique kind of folklore in that I don't know that, it, like I said, I don't know anyone anywhere, else, any other examples in the world where people are doing what gamers do at the table. And, and that's not just currently, but ever, um, the specific combination of things. And then on the other hand, we're drawing on all every extant folklore that's out there in order to try and do that. Anything else? We've been going for like two hours. I think we've done a, I think we've done a, made a good effort. Uh, but you know, if anyone ever wants to talk about stuff uh, again or personally, then shoot me an email. This uh, is really good. I learned so much about D and D that I never knew ever before. <laughs> <laughs> The funny thing is, Zach is proposing is pitching this whole thing from. I don't know if he gave a reason why. Maybe you don't need a reason why to like get on and hear and we all share what we know stuff about. But I think it's cool because on the anthropology side and on the academia side, there's all this there's this move towards open scholarship and, um, you know, the idea that you'd have to have. I mean, when my when my when that article I'm talking about comes out. If you don't have uh, academic affiliation, it would I think it would cost you like sixty dollars to read it. And that's just crazy land. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, I think that more and more things like this where we all just get together and talk about things that we like to talk about is good. I agree. So you should get on and talk about your stuff. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I think I might have just altered my thesis topic, not my like <laughs> local community, but altered the topic in the last 48 hours. That's good. Because I had a really great interview, and I was like, all right, we're going to talk about something totally different now. <laughs> but actually, I might be writing about stories now, because they're all talking about stories. So. Ooh, we'll I want to hear more about that. So you should definitely get on. Oh, I will yeah. get on at some point and hopefully say something cohesive about it. But all right, all right, guys. Okay. Well, thanks for coming and talking to me and letting me talk for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the knowledge bomb. <laughs> Absolutely. That was fun. And you only mentioned one philosopher. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, and I only mentioned Plato incidentally. That was like. Well, yeah. I was not even talking about anything Plato actually said. You normally talk a lot about philosophy? Yes. Apparently. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm the crazy theory guy. 
<laughs> I'm the crazy theory gal in my department. Thanks a lot, Kevin. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I gotta, I, I gotta get out of here. Have All a right. Good okay. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.